Hello, and welcome to the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios at the National Press Foundation. Today we're talking with Gilbert Bylone for MPF's Masterclass Series. The National Press Foundation is a nonprofit dedicated to helping journalists cover complex topics with depth and accuracy. Our mission includes journalists around the U.S. and around the world. I'm Sandy Johnson, President of the National Press Foundation. With me today is Gilbert Bylone, Editor of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch. Gilbert is a, win is a winner of MPF's Benjamin Bradley Editor of the Year Award. Gilbert, congratulations and thank you for joining us. Let's talk about Ferguson, which must be, which must rank as a defining moment in your career. Oh, no doubt. It's uh, been the biggest story I've ever been on, in a, certainly in a local sense, of something that can, not only was a huge story at the initial time, but is continuing to be a very big story for us and will be for years to come as the area grapples with a lot of very difficult issues way beyond the actual incident last August. Mm -hmm. Your remarks last night were so compelling because you talked about the dangers and obstacles that your reporters faced in the aftermath of the police shooting of Michael Brown. Mm -hmm. Could you describe some of those again? Well, I think the two, the two times it was most difficult for our staff was right after the shooting and there was uh, looting, there was some rioting, there was violence in the street. And that went on and then the protests went on. What we found for our staff was that in the day there would be kind of quiet civil protests, but at night was when they got in Ferguson where things became very unruly or unpredictable at times, big police presence. And so it was both an issue of being among the protesters, but also the police and being isolated from areas that, from each other or potentially uh, tear gas projectiles or uh, just scuffles and people running. Uh, and then after the grand jury decision in November, we had even more intense looting and rioting. It didn't last for as many days, but it was extremely intense. And the people in the field, the photographers and the reporters, experienced a lot of difficult situations, unsafe situations. They were attacked, they had equipment stolen, many were tear gassed. Uh, some evaded some very bad situations. One was chased out of a, a yard from a guy who had his gun out because he thought he was a looter coming into his house. So very difficult situations. Fortunately, nobody was seriously injured, but we did have people tear, um, pepper sprayed, where they got badly pepper sprayed to the point they were disabled photographers and so a, re a reporter in particular at a, at a protest after the grand jury decision. So those were in the field that was the difficulty. I think just the, the pace of the story for so many days, um, mm -hmm. people working 14, 16 hour days overnight, uh, the fatigue was a factor. We tried to do our best to, to mitigate that, but it was hard because our staff is limited and people really engaged. But we had, were very mindful of making sure people were rested and also were in situations that were safe. Mm -hmm. were you, how were you able to protect the staff? Did you have special equipment already on hand for this? Did you have to buy it? We had some, but we had to buy a lot more. Uh, we didn't have tear gas masks. That was something that we, we bought a number of those for people. Uh, we also had some bulletproof uh, vests. We had some hard helmets. We had other things like making sure people's phones were connected, making sure we had all the different uh, photography ability to send photos from the field, things like that, making sure we had equipment so they had even things like a safety pack with water bottles and a basic first aid kit, all that. We did some training with a police officer who came in who said, this is what you do in case you're injured or where to be, where to situate yourself, how to communicate with your colleagues, which was useful. And I think people really appreciated that. I, I felt better knowing that it was on people's mind. They weren't going to try to do them something unsafe. But mm -hmm. the volatility was there. We was unpredictable at times where even doing the best things, you could be in a situation in your car with people surrounding your car. Mm -hmm. Situations like that, that fortunately did, were not too bad, but they were threatening to many people. Mm -hmm. Now, is this the police you're talking about, or was it members of the community? It was both. Mm -hmm. um, we, the police, uh, well, there were a number of people who, not so much uh, with the Post-Dispatch, who were arrested and detained. Mm -hmm. We There were some TV crews that were, were tear gassed with projectiles that seemed to be directed at them, or if they weren't, it was right at them. Um, so we had those situations, but I think by and large, it was the protest because at, at night, it was very unpredicted. It wasn't just people marching and, and holding signs and, and with bullhorns. That was easier to cover for us because that was predictable. But at night, there were, we, we couldn't tell who was coming in. There was a lot of people milling in and out. So, and some were, were protesters. Other people may have just been people who were taking advantage of the situation to be out there. And that's where the looters were because we, we believe that many of the protesters, the actual protest organizers, weren't doing that. 
from what we can tell. But we, some of the other people, and that was the, the unpredictability for us, is who was in the crowd. And also with the police, they couldn't tell. We had so many people live streaming with their phones and cameras. Mm -hmm. Who's legitimate media, the news media, who maybe be somebody on their own, who may be working for an organization. So they began to think that anybody with a camera was, was a potential threat. We wore badges and we did other things. When we also, they began to know our people out in the field. So night after night, they would know People like Robert Cohen, David Carson, some of our photographers became very well known to the, the police there. And so they, that helped them uh, evade some situations. Uh, the newsroom must have been chaotic. I mean, the, it was such a fast-paced story. It broke from many different vantage points mm -hmm. over the, the first months. How did you deal with that in terms of getting information out to your readership? Well, it was a challenge for us to internally communicate with particularly the people in the field when things got crazy. Twitter was a big, a big part of being able to, uh, we also communicated by text, we had phone calls, uh, but sometimes somebody might not be in communication for 10 or 15 minutes when things were, were pretty dicey, we would get concerned and we would check in, check in on Twitter, send us a text, let us know you're okay. So the communication internally was a challenge when things were very, unpredictable and, and uh, a lot of peop people running around. During the day, it was a little bit easier, but again, the fatigue problem became a factor. People would work till midnight, one, two in the morning, and then often be, you know, be building a photo gallery or writing stories for online. So this all, throughout this whole pace, we're, we're on our website, we're tweeting, we're, we're putting things up on social media, we're, we're writing for our, our, our website, people are blogging. So it, we had reporters tweeting photos, we had photographers reporting stories, so it was, uh, a little bit chaotic, but I, I was. I think about it now. We did a very good job communicating, but it was a challenge at times. Uh, different editors and different reporters. Many of us who weren't in the field were either in the office or at home, communicating, watching the social media, looking at our website to make sure one that people were safe, and two we, we we needed to know if we needed to do any other changes, get more people out in the field. Mm -hmm. So at those times, now it's it's more of a story where there are protests. They're more confined and they're more predictable, and we know there's a time limit more. They don't go on all night. So, but at the time when the National Guard was out there, we had many uh, police, the county SWAT teams and others. That was probably the most difficult time for us to communicate. Mm -hmm. In a 24-7 world, you still have to produce a newspaper. Mm -hmm. You've got to communicate all day long, and then at the end of the day, you have to produce a newspaper. How did you, how did you deal with that in the newsroom in terms of organizing your thoughts and deciding what was going on the website, which was probably everything, I guess, right. versus what was going to go into your printed product in the morning? Well, that was one of the biggest challenges for our editors because there was so much information and we were constantly writing through stories. And then what you're going to do for the print edition will be usually some kind of a boiling down or a reassessment of what we have and try to update as much as we can. Whereas when we're online, we're just putting up whatever we can at the moment. We'd, and we would note that this was updated at 12.15, this was updated at 12.45. But then for the print edition, our editors and copy editors and desk editors needed to winnow through that. So what we tried to do is pull out information, use bullets, other, other things that could kind of concisely summarize what happened, although through the day we had a very large running diary of what was going on photographically as well as with words. So it was a challenge, but it was, uh, people were good at that. We were able to, we had lots of conversations among editors. Uh, it could get chaotic at night, particularly for the, the desk, for the, the news desk and the copy desk, because things might just start going at 11.30 and now we have a noon, uh, midnight deadline. It's what can we get in the paper right now? What was going to go to online? So it was it was a challenge, but I think people responded to that well because we're able to both think what is it going to look like in print? What can we make? What deadlines? We push deadlines on many nights, and so mm -hmm. we had cooperation from our circulation department because we it was just not really known what would happen in the next few minutes. Mm -hmm. How did this story affect your circulation or your page views? Well, with page views, we know definitely that. Um, it, huge amount of traffic. It was through the day and through the night. Uh, we were AP linked to us uh, there on their their mobile site. It was, went directly to our site. Others were doing that. Uh, many were picking up the photos and stories. So we had a, and was, we've still had a, a we have a spike year over year before Ferguson to now. Uh, it's not as great as it was in August and November when things were at the hairiest, but we still have seen a lot of people are interested in, interested in staying with that story. Circulation-wise, single copy, there was when we knew that uh, uh, grand jury was coming down and we knew there were other days, it'd be Sunday, sometimes we'd up the run for a single copy. Uh, th that is, is probably less of a factor now, but there's still a lot of interest in the print edition because that's where we do a lot of our investigative work. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. 
You had a bird's eye view of the Ferguson story. When the national media swooped in, were you surprised at their depiction of it? Um, I think probably when things were at the, the most volatile, the most violent and most unpredictable, that was when I thought sometimes, it, it, I, I don't think it was intentional, but when you saw four or five blocks of an area where people were protesting and there would be some either looting or violence or police presence, the very militarized police presence. It was a very small area, but it, on TV across the board, when you have cable anchors who were filling lots of time, which many did, it begins to look like a war zone. And it wasn't a war zone, but it was a dangerous situation. And I think that sometimes people, from what we heard from others outside the St. Louis area, some of whom were St. Louis natives, that their hometown was burning and this was, uh, you know, this was mayhem that was going to be uncontrolled, but it wasn't that bad. I do think a lot of the national media did do and are still doing a good job doing the story. I think they've come back and looked at things like municipal courts and policing and cameras and the C civilian review board and other things that we've been covering locally intensely. They're doing a good job with that. I think the, the main thing was when things were really really violent and, and it, the looting was at its worst. It, it, it made a very bad image for the area, which of course it was reality, but it wasn't, it was, St. Louis wasn't burning to the ground and it wasn't chaos that threatened everything. People in Ferguson, people in Delwood, yes, they've suffered and we've written a lot about that. It is, it is indeed a problem today because those bur businesses have been burned down. There are people still afraid to go in that area, even people who are familiar with it, still have, the businesses are trying to rebuild. So I think they largely in the national media did a good job. There were a few p bits of misinformation that went out that was just flat wrong, like the police chief resigning, he didn't. Um, the fact that Darren Wilson did not suffer a, a, an orbital fracture to his face in the, in the, the melee with uh, Michael Brown, that was reported and picked up. Social media was worse at that, but there were a few news organizations that picked up on that. So I, I wouldn't say that was the bulk of them, but we did have to be very mindful of what we were reporting and how we were verifying that. Mm -hmm. How do you keep your staff motivated when a story goes on and on and on? There's a fatigue factor mm -hmm. and there's also complacency like, oh, more looting, more riots. Mm -hmm. How did you try to keep them, uh, keep morale up in the newsroom? I think the motivation was always high. People just locked in. They knew how significant this story was from the beginning. That was not the problem. It was in fact, and sometimes demotivating people to say, you need to get some rest. We need you for the long term. This, we don't know how long the protests are going to go. You've worked 16 hours, get some sleep, take a day off, those kinds of things. Um, for the editors, we did have to be mindful of, is it, oh, here's just another protest, or here's, you know, keeping, keeping that, you know, in, in some kind of scope. And, but we had to be present. Now, what you write and how much uh, credence you give to that and how much airtime or you, you put on that is something we have to judge, is this newsy? And we're still in that mode now because there are protests every day somewhere. Mm -hmm. There are rallies, there's press conferences, there's various events, there's uh, legislative meetings, city council meetings, county meetings. So we're still trying to weigh what is news, just the fact that five people stand up in a meeting and, and shout out at something, is that what it was before? Probably not. We try to look for that impact and put it in some context. Um, but we are, we're, we're still in it for a long haul, and that's going to be, those are going to be the more in-depth stories, and as we try to chart change over time, that's, that's a challenge, but it's also something that we're, we have a lot of efforts for that we're doing from government records and other investigative work that we're trying to see this from a long lens, and it's hard when you're in the, under the the microscope, and you're expected, I gotta be live on Twitter, I gotta be live on the social media, I've gotta be, our paper has to be fresh and have original content. By the way, what's the long lens? And that is a challenge for a paper of our size. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Let's talk about context for a minute. Mm -hmm. In addition to the running, breaking story, which you know was running your staff ragged, you produced some really excellent content about education, about poverty, mm -hmm. about um, unemployment in, in that community. Could you talk about trying to juggle, the, you know, the breaking news versus the enterprise? I think that was one of the one of the hard things for our editors to do is we, we needed to do both, and it was not just the editors; it was uh, the, the staff trying to uh, ally the the people to say who's going to be pulled off, who can who has the best knowledge of this. But we were asking a lot of big questions, and we continue to do that because there's many many underlying issues that came out from this. It was not just policing; it was not just Ferguson. It's region-wide, in many cases nation nationwide. So it's, it became, uh, and still is, what are those questions we should be asking? We ask ourselves, sometimes it could be from readers, so, uh, many times it's from the reporters out in the field who will notice things or see things, and they've been there enough that they can see over six months how things may be changing or some issues. So it's, it's, it is, but it is something that we have to, 
we, we say walk and chew gum. It's, it is true because it's hard. And we have a limited staff. I wish we had you know, more people who do full-time investigation. We, we don't have as many as we'd like, but we have some very, very good ones. So we're using, also the other thing is we, we're using people outside whatever their quote beat or expertise is, and they've done outstanding jobs, higher education reporter, religion reporters, people who transportation reporter was out on the field. I mean, people, our city hall reporter was in Ferguson. He covers St. Louis City Hall. So mm -hmm. we, what we did is we drafted everybody and everybody seemed very eager to get involved, would volunteer. We'd have people come in on their days off and say, what do you need me to do? I can rewrite, I can work the web, I can be in the field. And so motivation wasn't a problem. It's, I think thinking of those really keen ideas and trying to, to really dig in many, many places. And it's still going to be a long-term challenge for us, but we know that for this story, it has bi much bigger legs than, than just simply the event in the last six months. Mm -hmm. yeah. Can we talk a little bit about lessons learned? Are there things about Ferguson that you have definitely learned as an editor that you think you can apply to breaking news coverage down the road? Sure. Uh, well, I think one thing, it's really validated our role in the community. That I don't need to convey this to the staff. They know that they're relevant. They know that they're making an impact whether it's a story, a photo, uh, editorial, a package, an investigative piece that breaks some new ground. They see the vitality of what we're doing. That, that's great because sometimes when you, when you don't have a story to rally around, there can be, you know, what are we doing? There's uncertainty in our business, all those things. We're not, I'm not saying that's gone away, but it's not the focal point right now. It's the journalism. I also think a lesson we learned is just how we have to be in real time, that, that we are the biggest provider. We have the biggest newsroom. TV can do a lot of things, uh, other outside media can come in, there are other media in town who can do things, but we have the ability to do original work and we need to look at it that way. We need to be fast, but we also need to be smart. And finally, I, I'd say that, uh, you know, that many people in the community now look at us in a different way, even some of our harshest critics. We still have them, they're not <laughs> gone, but uh, the idea that they realize when they see the, the whole span of work that we're doing and what we're trying to do, even if they disagree with an editorial, how we play the story, it's toned down some. Initially, it was very, very divisive. I think there's still a lot of raw emotion, but they also see that over time, the span of stories that we're doing, that we really are trying to take a role in the community to bring issues to the forefront so the community can deal with them. Mm -hmm. Have you yourself done outreach to the community? I mean, has there been a give and take with community leaders? Oh yeah, I mean, mm -hmm. I've, I've done that a lot before. It's become more intense. Fortunately, I knew many of the players and so did our staff. I knew the Ferguson mayor from various mm -hmm. other, I, I knew some of the, I knew the, the, the chief, we knew the, the county executive, we knew the mayor, we know the police chief in St. Louis. So, and then from there, the community itself, I get out quite a bit and, and so I, I, it was good feedback. And I, what I've heard almost to the person, particularly people who are the business leaders and the civic leaders and the, the political leaders, is respect for the newspaper, that we need you here, and that's good to hear. Now, they might not like some of the stories you do that can mm -hmm. put them on the spot, like the governor, but he does appreciate the role we're playing, and, and he knows that he and others know, the mayor and others have been very complimentary that it, the, the role of a, a community-based newspaper, regional-based newspaper, is really important for stories like this. Because we're able to do stories that you can't do in 140 w words or can't do in a two-minute TV piece. They have much more complexity and when we're doing those stories. And um, sometimes a national paper will come in and do it, but it feels a little bit different because it's not home. This is, we're in the backyard and we can devote a lot of time and space and expertise to those. Mm -hmm. Well, a spectacular story and your passion about the work that your staff has done really shines through. So let's talk about other parts of mm -hmm. your journalism career. Mm -hmm. So what was your first job in journalism? Uh, my well, first job was, a uh, full-time job was working night cops at the Fort Worth Star-Telegram in Texas. And it was a great learning experience. And actually some of the experiences from back then, it was clearly not a Ferguson, but being on the front lines of chasing news and being exposed to what it's like to be a cop reporter and being in some situations where there, there could be some danger when I did stories about gangs and so it's, it's sat in with some uh, a robbery team and sitting in a convenience store with shotguns and they gave me a gun and said, <laughs> just in case something goes bad here. We did nothing happen, but the idea was that to get a feel for what it's like to be a police reporter and, and, and how that works and also to get to know how police think. And they to, they, I would think that's an important role in this story that sometimes gets forgotten. It's, 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 it's complicated. So that was my first job and I enjoyed that. And then I went on and did many other, other, other types of beat reporting courts and city hall and things like that. Mm -hmm. so. How did you morph from being a reporter to an editor? Was it a conscious decision or did it just sort of happen like it happened like it does in it, some newsrooms? Yeah, it, for me it was a conscious decision. Mm -hmm. I was editor in my uh, college paper at the University of Arizona and my goal 
was I wanted to go out and report. I didn't want to get into editing too soon, but get some get some muscles built for being an actual reporter and then become an editor. And fortunately, I was allowed to do that. And, and in Dallas, they, they gave me, I was still f reasonably young. I'd probably been reporting seven years, something like that. And they, I started doing part-time editing, but then I got on the path of it. But I'd always wanted to be an editor. I, th I thought the, the leadership role, the ability to, to uh, shape stories and work with reporters was something I wanted to do. Some people don't want it. There's some great reporters who don't want to be managers. Mm -hmm. And I respect that. For in my sake, I did want to become an editor. Mm -hmm. Um, tell us about the idea for Aldea and what your goals were in creating it. Well, Aldea was, uh, it was, it was early 2000s and uh, that we saw that our publisher noticed and other people said there's a huge population that's underserved in the Dallas area. I'm not sure what the current numbers are, but it's well over a million Latinos in, in Dallas. Probably it may even be up to 1.5 million. It could be that In high. Dallas itself? In the Dallas uh -huh. area. The mm -hmm. metro area is about 6 million now. Mm -hmm. So it's a significant population. And they knew, we knew, and many other newspapers knew, that many of them were not using our, our either the newspaper or the website. Partially it was language. Sometimes it could be cultural issues. It could be stories that they were seeking. Um, so we were going after the Spanish predominantly Spanish-speaking market, but there was also people who were bilingual. The idea was there's content that the Dallas Morning News can't provide in the depth. And from, from my own personal viewpoint, I knew that many of the people were immigrants or recent immigrants, families of immigrants, they may be born here, who were also bridging the, the, the language world, the cultural world. And this was an ability for them to integrate. And this is how we, we, we talk to people. You know, this is how you get your kids in school. This is how you get your kids immunized. This is how you get become citizens, how you become vote. Yes, and all these things that we take for granted, but if you're an immigrant from anywhere coming to this country, trying to negotiate some Byzantine government situations and what to do when they want to do PTA and all those things that may not be necessarily familiar to you, that's what we tried to do. Mm -hmm. And it became very beneficial for many people. It was also fun and interesting, things like sports and entertainment, mm -hmm. but the core of what a lot of us were doing was trying to make sure that people felt like they had the services and the goods and also that the contributions they were making would be recognized. Mm -hmm. So there wasn't much overlap in content between the Dallas Morning News and Eldia. Well, there's some, yeah. Mm -hmm. We would translate stories and vice versa. There mm -hmm. were times that we would have our reporters go into the community and do a story on a business or a, some kind of controversy that may be brewing between the Hispanic Chamber and we had some of those stories that the Dallas Morning News would, would translate. And then there were stories like immigration that would come out of the Washington Bureau would be translated into that. A lot of it was original. Some of it was uh, also wire services that we'd pick up out of Mexico and Notimex and other places like that, where they would they would have specific to the, the language, uh, not only language, but where people were from. That was what the Dallas Morning News could do. If you're from another country, we have limited space, just as mm -hmm. certainly we do in St. Louis. Mm -hmm. You're not going to be able to keep up to the level you can uh, with, with a Spanish language newspaper. Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Uh, well, the, there continue to be many Latino immigrants coming into the country. What is the media doing today at large that is filling that gap for them, that information gap? Well, w one, Latinos are very social media savvy. Mm -hmm. They're huge users of Twitter, Facebook, Instagram, and all that. So media are finding that out, that this is one way to reach it. I think one of the diff most difficult things for, for mainstream publications, like in St. Louis and others, is just what language do you want to do? What, mm -hmm. what age group? It's the same conundrum we fight with. Do you want to go for the millennials or do you want to go to your core readers who are probably 50 and up? Mm -hmm. So some of that goes on with the Latino community. I do think that some, a misunderstanding with a lot of media is that there are a lot of people who are younger, younger than me, who are certainly living in both worlds. They're mm -hmm. comfortable in both languages and they go where, where the content is best. So they may be watching you know, any type of network television or reading the New York Times or the Post-Dispatch or the Dallas Morning News, but they also go for other content to other places. They may be going to uh, Spanish language uh, Univision, they may mm -hmm. be going to Fusion, which is bilingual, other places like that, because they're after the content that they're not going to get from the mainstream outlet. So that continues to be an evolving opportunity, I really believe, for, for many publications. Uh, but I think the biggest thing is, should I do Spanish? Should I do English? Should I do bilingual? That's always a, a question that we ask. And I'd say maybe you do a little bit of both because uh, these are people who do seek information, are big users of media. And if, we've, if we neglect them, they're the fastest growing part of our country. So. Mm -hmm. um, your Twitter profile, mm -hmm. you call yourself a refugee from Texas. Mm -hmm. Why is Texas such an important part of your identity? Well, I grew up in Arizona, but I would say the Southwest is still very much in my blood. It's, uh, it's, it's the experience of being in the Southwest, a lot of it's the Latino experience. It's 
being around Spanish, eating the food, the music, the media, being in an environment where it's very common. I'm in a situation now where we have it, but it's a little less so. But I, you know, I like to go to concerts and, and I watch a lot of Spanish language news still because mm -hmm. I feel like that's the way I'm going to be plugged in, particularly what's happening in Latin America, but also on national news because how they cover immigration may not be the same way as some of the networks do. It's mm -hmm. just a different viewpoint. It's much more about the immigrants themselves as opposed to some of the politicians positioning themselves. They get that too, mm -hmm. but it's much more depth, much more time. So I think that's in the Southwest was, I grew up there. I, I love the desert. I love the border. It's a border is a very, you know, unusual, I think I'd say a unique environment that many people don't understand. So I miss some of that, but at the same time, we have a pretty vibrant Latino population where we are. It's smaller, but a lot of connections, people who come there for universities, people who come to work, people who are mostly come from other places who have connected. So I, I've been able to fill a lot of those gaps. Mm -hmm. And then just one final question. What advice do you have for a young person considering a career in news? I think it's, it's not different from when I was coming up some years ago, is that you need to know the basics. You need to know how, what the accuracy, how we base in facts, how to research, how to think, how to analyze, how's to, how to po pose questions, how to do things that journal the basis of journalism have not changed. At the same time, what's different from when I came up is you have to be much more versatile. You, and, the, and, and the people that are coming in our mm -hmm. newsrooms are. They're, they're just native to technology. It doesn't scare them to do a video or, or we have people doing vines and reporters doing this. And the technology, it's not the technology so much as it's the platform that you're using, but you still have to have that undergirding of, I know my information. I have some understanding of history. I read, I read a lot. I read a lot of different places I keep up. I read in depth. I just don't read Twitter. I just don't <laughs> read, you know, 10 second videos. I do have some understanding of how these things fit into complex society. At the same time, they're fast. And I, that's what I'm finding of our people is that they're much more open. Uh, and we, we, for a lot of them, they're training us. Mm -hmm. We're finding that our newer, younger, and sometimes not so new, some people who have adapted and learned, they're holding some. We had interns last summer doing a seminar on do Google Analytics. <laughs> an intern. She was still at the University of Missouri and, a, a, and another one who came in and showed our staff of how you can watch traffic and how your stories are performing and how you can increase that. So I, I see it now as it's a, it's a world that's changed, but the basic is you have to be a good journalist and a good thinker. You have to like news. You have to read. You have to keep up to date. Well, terrific. Thank you, Gilbert Bylone, editor of the St. Louis Post-Dispatch, for joining us at the Evelyn Y. Davis Studios here at the National Press Foundation, where we are making good journalists better.